So now, as I said before, to me, the key to all this, dinosaurs, dragons, the Bible. And when you start to really get into understanding these things, you know, it starts to point itself out. You know, the truth starts to slow it because you have to start from the beginning. You got to go back. And that's the thing. They want to talk about, they tell us 65 million years ago, dinosaurs exist. Uh, and they went extinct before man came into being. But we found too much proof, too much evidence of humans and dinosaurs coexisting on this planet. And the uh, Bible talks about this when you understand, which we'll get into. And um, there's too much. It's just so much that you cannot ignore, especially the imagery and the rituals and the celebrations that go on that is surrounding dinosaurs or surrounding dragons, I should say, which we know, as I said before, they were called dragons, not dinosaurs. Dinosaurs is a later name, 19th century. So they can't ignore this stuff. Got to look at it. We got to pay attention to what this stuff is really talking about and how deep it is. And it's deep, as you'll see. So we have the ancients, you know, so many depictions and drawings of dinosaurs, you know, proving that they must have coexisted because no way they could draw these these dinosaurs if they didn't see them. You have all the stories from, you know, the Sumerian culture, the ancient Egyptians, the even the Asians talking about these dragons, all these mythologies and stories everywhere, stuff that we can't ignore. So even if you want to go by the whole Sumerian story about this reptilian race, you know, altering the DNA of man, you know, that is implying that, you know, man was already here. It's the same thing with the Bible. The Bible already basically implying that our DNA or man was fabricated and that, you know, there was a man or a perfect man before us at one point, before what we know today as man, there was a perfect man that was altered to create what we have today. And it's also symbolized by the fall of man. Man was perfect. Then it was the fall of man. And then we get what we have today. So again, you can't, you can't ignore this stuff. You got to put it together and the pieces fit in very, very unbelievable ways when you start to pay attention. So now Adam and Eve in the garden is representing perfect man, man as it was at some point until the serpent came and changed that. Now, as I said, it's a lot of different things we can get from the garden of Eden story. Now we know for a fact, hundred percent dinosaurs existed and they ruled on this planet. Is it far fetched to believe that there could be or could have been a reptilian race similar to us during that time? No, it's not far fetched to think that it's something that we really have to entertain and think about because there's too much going on here with this dinosaur or this um, reptilian reference. So when you begin to understand, we see that the Adam and Eve in the garden representing perfect man. The serpent is rep representing the reptilian who came and changed man into what we are today, came and altered man. So when you look at the story, this is exactly what it's telling us. You have perfect man, man representing something different until the serpent came or reptilian came and changed that. It's going to make a lot of sense later. Came and changed that whole thing. And the Bible talks about, you know. All the creeping things and all the animals and everything that was created before man. And that fits, you know, with evolution theory. But, you know, when we take a look at this whole, you know, reptilian thing and begin to understand how we fit in with it. We know in evolution, you had reptilians, mammals and birds were the last three to basically evolve on an evolutionary scale on the chart. So we know they tell us that humans and primates share a common ancestor well birds also share that common ancestor with us and it's you know weird to see that the last three humans or mammals reptilians and birds share this common ancestor so we know that um you have this whole missing link and you have the fact that this common ancestor basically is the missing link and that if we understood what this common ancestor was, we will be able to figure out, you know, where we came from. So if you look at the evolutionary chart, you know, this whole common ancestor should fit here on the chart. And um, it should come right after the uh, reptilians, the reptiles. So now the thing is, you had, as I talked about before, uh, before the whole green anole 
had its genome sequenced. And it says here, you know, the green and old genome contains approximately 17,500 protein coding genes. Of those genes, 4,000 are also found in humans, mouse, dog, possums, platypus, chicken, zebra finch, and puckerfish. So we see we got that connection. Now, and again, as I said, the last three to evolve, mammals, birds, and reptiles. You know, it says here, it turns out and it appears mammal hair, bird feathers, and reptile scales all share common ancestry. So now, human skin, you know, mammal hair, bird feathers, reptilian skin, all same common ancestor. This is why you see people that have that rare skin disease where they grow scales. This is why we see people that are extra hairy. You have some people just grow way more hair, you know, than others. And, um, we share this common ancestor. Now, this is one of the things that, you know, in my research and probably some of yours as well, one of the things that um, basically had me stuck for a while is, again, they tell us that we do not, we did not evolve from primates. We didn't come from them, but we share a common ancestor that they can't tell us, you know, what that is. Now, the whole thing is this. When you look at chimps, when you look at monkeys, you can't deny the similarities. I mean, you just can't. Look at the hands. Look like ours. You know, teeth, eyes. It is clearly that, you know, it's clear that we basically are in the same, you know, genetic code or, you know, we share that same common ancestor. That is something to me that is clear. Obviously, we didn't evolve from them because we don't see primates turning into humans. So what it looks like when you begin to understand this whole thing is whatever our common ancestor was, it must have had two different evolutionary paths, one different uh, from the evolution that the uh, primates be and then one for humans, because you have the fact that you have this missing link, whatever it is that basically created these primates and they went their path, which stops. And then we have ours being as though we don't, we didn't come from them. So we took another direction from this common ancestor and we went another way as far as our evolution. But they basically inherit, we basically took, they took traits from the primates and put it with us and gave us some of these traits and these genes or what have you to uh, further our evolution. So we're clearly different when you look at um, primates. They have 48 chromosomes. We have 46. And the first two of our chromosomes are fused together. So that shows you right there, we're talking about genetic manipulation. We have 64 codons. Now of the 64 codons, only 22 are active or are basically um, encoded with uh, the universal genetic code, you know, that we carry. So these 20 that are basically active in producing uh, this genetic code are basically, you know, it gives us amino acids. So we understand how important amino acids uh, are. You know, it says here the role of amino acids goes beyond building blocks. They are essential for the synthesis of proteins, enzymes, hormones, neurotransmitters, metabolic pathways, mental stabilization, and just about every function that takes place within the human body. So when you think about that and you think about having 64 codons that's supposed to, you know, produce these amino acids, that's basically going to give us these different functions. And we only have 20 that's giving us these functions. So uh, the understanding is if we produced, if all 64 of the codons was produced in amino acids, we would have way more functions from the body. We'd be, we'd be able to do a lot more than what we do today. We'll be different genetically. We'll be different humans. But... We only have certain ones that work. So again, you have, you know, the fact that we have all these codons. It's like, why give us this? You understand what I'm saying? Why give us this? It's the same thing with the brain. Why do we have all these things that we are only using some? It doesn't make sense. You know, it doesn't make sense. It's like, you know, having a car, but you pushing it. Yeah, it got four wheels. You know, that'll help it roll. You can put it in neutral to make it easier. You can beep the horn. You can put somebody in it, you know, to steer it. But, you know, 
why do all that and not just have the car function correctly and just drive the car, you know, instead of pushing it around. So for us to have all these components that's supposed to do so many different things and a lot of them we have no clue what that is, they're shut off, you know, shut off. So now when we look at these chimpanzees and these great apes, you know, their bones are different than us. You know, their nature is, of course, different. Their bones are thicker than ours. They're able to take way more, you know, pressure, trauma to the body than we can. If we had to go one-on-one -on -one with an ape or, you know, a chimp, they kill us. They rip our hand off. So it's a lot that we can look at and see that, you know, if you're going to sort of create something better, because seemingly what it looks like if they, they was going one way with the primates and they decided to scrap that, and go a different way, which we're going to talk about in a second. But we're weaker. You know, it's like we are we are weak, weaker, but, you know, more intelligent. But we don't really truly understand the real nature of these primates. And it gets much deeper than that. So it says here, another as yet unexplained phenomenon, the sequencing revealed, has to do with the lumps of DNA known as centimeters, which hold together the two separate strands of DNA that make up chromosome acting somewhat like the center of an X. Strangely, nine of the 22 centromeres, the monkeys have repositioned themselves on their chromosomes in the last 25 million years. As to why this happened, no one knows, said the researcher Mariano Rocci at the University of Barai in Italy. The recent monkey genome sequence should prove invaluable to biomedical research and physician scientist Ajit Varki at the University of California at San Diego, who participated in the chimpanzee genome sequencing project. And if we can get the genome sequences of one representative from each primate lineage, we could reconstitute the ancestral primate genome what the genome of our common ancestors some 40 to 50 million years ago looked like. He told Life Science that would be an amazing feat. So what does this mean? What is this saying here? It's saying that the primates we know of today, not only us, but they as well, had their DNA altered. He's saying that if they could do the sequencing of each, of one of each of the ancestral primates, you know, follow their lineage back and do a genome sequencing of each one in each lineage, they could probably get what, you know, the primates must have looked like before this whole change. Now, as he said, they had their chromosomes repositioned, you know, and they don't know how that happened or why that happened, which that would, of course, change their nature, change their appearance as well. And it's amazing. So these monkeys we have walking around today, you know, look completely different were completely different and that probably was done you know to probably confuse them or probably to um for them thinking uh, ahead later it will be tougher for you to understand exactly who that common ancestor was if they were left alone so by them having this mix-up with the chromosomes and then now them having to basically try to go back and we're talking about you have primates that's extinct and, you know, ones that we probably that existed that we probably don't know ever existed on top of that. So it might be impossible to, you know, do a sequencing of all of them from every lineage to figure out, you know, what it looked like or what that common ancestor uh, must have been. So now that's crazy. You know, we have absolutely no clue what the primates are, but we study them and we know they are, you know, unique. They are definitely related to us. It's clear to see when you look at them. You know, for all we know, they could have looked like this. They could have looked like Planet of the Apes. They could have been walking around, talking, and had intelligence. We don't know. It seems as if this common ancestor, whoever created them, created them first. And they were a certain way. And they were gone in that direction. And then all of a sudden, you know, they were altered. Their evolution was stopped and they were changed into what we know, you know, as primates today. What we see them as today. And then they stopped there and went with us and took some of the genetic code and genes from them, you know, and placed them to us and started with us, like as if they were starting something different. This is why, you know, they say, the scientists always say that we didn't evolve from primates, but we share a common ancestor because clearly they was first 
and their evolution was stopped and it was changed. And then they began to create us. You know, it's one of the weirdest things, you know, that you look at when you see this whole thing. It's one of the things that had me puzzled for a while. I had to really dig into it and, and pull it out and say, you know what, that's that has to be what happened. But the proof is right there when you look at the fact that, you know, their genetics, their code was altered and we have no clue. This, everything you're going to see when I'm getting into this stuff is showing you tampering. You know, it's, they're not saying, and they're clear on this, they're not saying that it was a mutation or something happened in nature. They're saying, I don't know. Every time you go and you look, I don't know. They say it clearly. We don't know what happened. They don't know what happened. You know, it's, something was done to alter that path and to change them into what we see today. So now let's go to the garden. Let's look at Genesis 314 it says here, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field upon thy belly shall thou go and thus shall thou eat all the days of thy life. Now we probably read that a thousand times. A lot of people read that verse. And we just read it and it's subtle clues, you know, in the Bible to always talk about. You got to pay attention to the wording and how they say things. So when it's talking about this serpent that's supposed to be, you know, in the garden, it says, cursed him on his belly. Meaning what? If it's a snake, we assume it's already on its belly, right? It's a serpent. It's supposed to already be on its belly. But he's saying, no, I curse you on your belly. Meaning what? It couldn't have been a snake in the garden. See, these depictions, they make these depictions to fool you. Plain and simple, it wasn't a serpent in the garden. It was a dragon in the garden. And when you pay attention to so many different things, we won't get into this. It's clear as day what they're trying to say and what they're trying to allude to with the snake being the reptilian. It's a dragon in the garden, a serpent dragon, not a serpent. Which is why when you say, I'm going to curse you on your belly, meaning... Those arms, it's going to be gone that we see with these serpent dragons. Now, when you look at uh, in the Bible, them basically giving us dragons in the Bible, which we'll get into this. You have to really pay attention to what it's talking about. So it says here, Isaiah 27, 1. In that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent. Even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So it's giving you that comparison to serpent dragons. So now we go to Job 41. Remember, in Job 41, you have the story where God is basically, you know, cussing out Job for talking back to him. You know, he's basically saying, like, you know, how you talking back to me? You don't got no fear of me. But you scared all these beasts on the on the uh, planet and all these tigers and dragons or what have you and these things that he named in the story. He's saying you scared of these things, but how you ain't scared of me? And I'm the one who made them. So here in uh, uh, Job 41, it's saying, Canest thou draw out Leviathan with a hook or his tongue with a cord which thou let it down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose? Or bore his jaw through with a thorn. Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant forever? So it's saying, can you do this stuff? Can you do this with the Leviathan? You know, the Leviathan is big beast. You won't do this when you can't catch it with a hook. You can't do this because, you know, you're scared of it. It'll kill you. But, you know, you take that type of direction with the Leviathan but yet, you know, you talk back to me and I created it. Basically what God's saying. So the most important part, we skip down here. Let's go to 19 and 22. It says, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go of smoke as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Sounds like a fire breathing dragon to me. And it's talking about the Leviathan here talking about the serpent dragon. So you get this comparison again of the serpent and the dragon. So again, when it's talking about serpents, when you understand even when you take the words back, you know, to Hebrew, Greek, or what have you, it's going to give you serpent. But when you understand what these serpents was called back then, they were referring to them as serpent, the serpent dragons. Interchangeable, same thing, any way you want to look at it. But 
we can just go straight. Revelations 12, verse 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So again, we see it in the Bible, where they're referring to the serpent as a dragon. There's too many references, too many stories around the world that we see where it's talking about dragons. A matter of fact, if you go into uh, Kentucky, where they have the Creation Museum, they have the Creation Museum of Kentucky. It's ran by Christians, but they have a dragon ex uh, exhibition there, a whole exhibit on dragons. So, you know, clearly the Christians acknowledge the fact that, you know, the Bible is talking about dragons. It's talking about dinosaurs when it's talking about the behemoth. When you read again in Job, it's talking about the behemoth, talking about, you know, these huge uh, uh, dinosaurs. We know we look at China. We look at the serpent dragon in China and all the mythology that surrounds that. You look at the Chinese Zodiac. Everything on that Zodiac is real. You have a dragon there as well. So it's no reason for us to believe that that dragon is not real as well or wasn't real at some point. So we got to look at this stuff. We go down to, um, you know, look at the Aztecs and the feathered serpent. We talked about how you had this whole, you know, common ancestor between birds, reptilians and mammals. Well, if you have feathers evolving from scales, the perfect example of that is with the feathered serpent. We see down in, um, with the Mayans and the Aztecs down in Mexico. You have Quetzalcoatl when you see the the uh, depictions of the feathered serpent. We've seen a feathered serpent in so many different places, giving you that whole connection still as a serpent dragon. Again, in ancient Kemet, you have the whole connection with Wajet Nekbet. You have a serpent and a bird giving you that connection. The same thing I was talking about before with the brain. And you have, as I said, the Great Pyramid representing the brain, the lower brain, the woman chamber, the queen's chamber, and the Great Pyramid, where you have it pointing to Draco, the Draco constellation. Again, serpent, dragon. It's everywhere. Everywhere you look, you see these depictions. You see these comparisons and them showing serpent dragons. Draco is Latin for draconian, meaning serpent dragon. Even the Greeks have dracontos. Dracontos, which is serpent, giant, sea fish. In ancient mythology, ancient Egyptian mythology, you have Apophis. Which, remember, Apophis is the enemy of Ra. You see in many depictions, Apophis is a serpent. Apophis attacking the solar boat, which is, I think is a reference to them when they astro traveling. Them, you know, obviously running into some kind of reptilian interference. You see many depictions of even Set battling, you know, Apophis. And this whole reference to astro travel and, you know, what we would think traveling through space, you know, in the spiritual body. And them having to do battle with serpents or the reptilians. And it's crazy. Remember, in the, uh, the story, Rod turns into the cat and kills Apophis. And you see in the depiction, Apophis, the serpent by that tree. You know, all these connections we see is stuff that you got to look at. And you got to understand all this stuff is here to give us this reference that we can't ignore. The ancient Egyptians also talked about dragons in the pyramid text. A lot of people don't know about that. You had then when it says in the pyramid text. Then when was an Egyptian serpent deity known from the time of the old kingdom, the Egyptians shunned him because he posed a threat to all deities. So powerful was his dragon like abilities. Then when possessed power over fire and he could generate a fiery conflagration so powerful that it would destroy even the gods. The dragon attempted this feat, but he fell to slaughter the deities because the spirit of the deceased king thwarted his attack. And we know we have with the Sumerians, you know, the great dragon here. The Babylonians worship uh, Baal and Marduk. And we also have to look at the Nagas, the Nagas serpents. To me, we look at the Nagas. They probably would represent, you know, what these beings, you know, this common ancestor could have possibly looked like. You know, seeing these depictions of this half man, half serpent 